Hello, I'm Madeline Reeves from the University of Manchester, and my presentation is called The Empty House Towards an Anthropology of Insecure Migration. I'd like to thank the organisers for the invitation to, to, to speak at this conference. It's a pleasure and an honour to take part. My aim over the next 20 minutes is to reflect a little on the categories that we use to discuss different forms and dynamics of migration within Eurasia. To ask in particular what the category of forced migration illuminates and obscures. And drawing on three ethnographic examples to offer some tentative notes towards an anthropology of insecure migration, a term I'll explore a little more below. What does it mean to come of age in a context where getting out becomes integral to the imagination of future itself, to the possibility of a future that has a future? To pose this question is to ask, I think, not just about particular forms and types of migration in which young people are engaged, but about the shifting horizons of imagination and, and anticipation that make an exit come to appear a compelling necessity to so many young people, despite the often crushing physical, financial and existential costs of doing so. This is not something that I'd specifically set out to study when I started researching labour migration between Kyrgyzstan and Russia. I was interested primarily in those who departed and in how they made a life as migrant workers in Moscow. My research over several years in Osh, Batken and Leylek in southern Kyrgyzstan has led me, however, to reflect on the force of migration as a social fact for young people who cannot leave as much as for those who do. One that seeps into all aspects of life, from styles of dress and the choices of names for children, from naming mar mar from marriage decisions to experiments with Islamic orthopraxy. In the larger project on which I'm working, I seek to understand the way that issues of intergenerational obligation and debt, or karas, are negotiated, how these obligations are gendered, and how they inflect concerns about staying and leaving in a context characterized by rising ethno-nationalism, environmental insecurity, and widespread financial debt. Here I've got a rather narrower goal, to consider how attention to subjective experiences of security and insecurity might help us to refine our own analytical categories in the study of Eurasian migration. I want to suggest that definitions of forced migration as they figure in policy and public life fail to grasp both the variety of reasons why a departure may come to be experienced as majbur, as a compelling necessity from a subjective point of view, and the ways that different sources of environmental, economic and political stress intersect with and magnify one another in ways that belie straightforward distinctions between migration that is free and that which is forced. In presenting an anthropological account of insecure migration, I seek then to interrogate the epistemic boundary work that links questions of deservedness and re recognition as a refugee or a forced migrant to particular kinds of coercion and experiences of flight. In developing this argument, I'm indebted to two recent scholarly interventions. First, ethnographic studies of security scapes in Central Asia have drawn attention to gendered experiences of security and insecurity as they manifest in the mundane spaces of daily life, taking a mashrutka, going to a cafe, to the market, or walking down the street, as well as what the authors call the agency and creativity of individual people in security making in ways that often bypass or ignore the state. I'm inspired by this work to consider how the search for an exit might itself be one such practice of security making, even as migration may be acknowledged to be full of risk. Second, I draw on recent anthropological work that explores how migration inflects the texture of daily life in places of departure, including household organization, expectations of a good life, or practices of courtship that might on the surface seem to have little to do with migration per se. This work is significant in directing our attention to the categories through which our informants describe and reason about the demands and possibilities of exit to various outsides. Thinking about migration as what Alici Elliott calls an ethnographically contingent object of study, I'm struck by certain recurrent tropes that figured in my interlocutors' accounts of obligation and demand. The need to migrate so as to create a house that could sustain family life into the future, for instance. 
the need to migrate to compensate parents for their care or to meet the obligations, including ritual obligations, that allowed one to perform and thus to become being a good son, daughter, father or mother. I was struck, in other words, by the force of town, of shar, of getting out, as in, in my interlocutor's accounts. This is relevant, I think, for our categories of scholarly analysis. Accounts of migration in public and political life are typically framed in the language of tidy binaries, push and pull, force and choice, political or economic drivers, labour migration versus asylum seeking or the search for refuge. Such distinctions inflect our scholarly practice too. In the university from where I'm speaking to you, for instance, there are separate master's courses in migration studies and forced migration studies housed in different academic departments. In policy terms, the distinction between migration that is putatively free and forced is treated as at once self-evident and are often as dictating the boundaries of public compassion. The EU, for instance, recognizes migration to be forced when, quotes, an element of coercion exists, including threats to life and livelihood, whether arising from natural or man-made causes. In legal practice, that distinction is usually treated narrowly and often in a rather blanket way, such that asylum status is accorded only to those who can demonstrate immediate threat to life and refused a priori by those who are deemed to have traveled from a safe country, as though safety itself is experienced identically by all citizens, irrespective of their social position, gender or sexual identity, economic resources and so on. In this context, debates over naming have become intensely politicized. Witness, for instance, terminological disputes over the European migration or refugee crisis in 2015, or in the UK at the moment, the Home Office's refusal to extend the category of asylum seekers to those who arrive in the UK by perilous boat journeys across the English Channel. Such distinctions often implicitly shape our analyses of migrations within Eurasia too. Accounts of different waves of migration between Central Asia and Russia, for instance, typically contrast the politically driven out migration of ethnic Russians and Russian speaking minorities in the immediate aftermath of independence with later waves of economic migration by young people in search of a better life. In Russian officialese and legal practice, the former are typically described as compatriots, Sartegisniki, returning to a historical homeland, or indeed as forced resettlers, Vunushtani Pirisilinsi, driven by threat of conflict. The latter are described, often with little critical interrogation, as labor migrants, Trudovoy Migranti, or guest workers, Gastarbaitiri, for whom a period of work in Russia is putatively an unencumbered economic choice, irrespective of the complex of reasons political, economic, environmental, existential, domestic, which might prompt someone to leave to work abroad. These distinctions contrasted with my ethnographic findings. In conversations and interviews, migration was often described as being compelled by, among other things, a failed harvest, chronic joblessness, a lack of water with which to irrigate one's crops, spiraling debts with impossible rates of interest, and particularly for those living along the Kyrgyzstan-Tajikistan border, the constant threat that an altercation between border guards and local youths, a topalong as it was locally described, might escalate as it did in April and May this year into all out war, Sohosh. These chronic endurative stresses often extended, especially for women, to domains that did not fit a politico-legal account of force, such as the wounding capacity of gossip or stairs, the visceral shame, uyat, that accompany childlessness or divorce, the obligation to repay debts after family tragedy, or the hidden wounds of domestic violence. My point here is not to flatten all questions of motivation in all their complexity into the same category, nor to suggest that all motivations for departure are necessarily negative. Indeed, the need to build a decent house for one's children or to provide a fitting wedding for one's son or daughter could also be experienced as a powerful demand, as a form of majbur, Indeed, the force of popular judgment of maintaining face in front of the el, the people, was often spoken as the most compelling force of all. To illustrate this point, let me turn to some ethnographic vignettes. Since this is a recorded talk, and I want to give descriptive specificity to the places where the research was conducted, some details have been changed to protect my informant's confidentiality. <laughs> 
first to the village of Aksai. 40 years ago, Aksai was a village with a future. Constructed on stony land in the 1970s along the border with Tajikistan to house a growing rural population relocated from mountain settlements deemed lacking perspective. Socialist modernity in this village of the plan was always just around the corner. Nuruddin, born in 1981, spent his early years in the mining town of Shorab, just across the border in Tajikistan. But his parents had moved to Aksai during Perestroika, conscious of growing inter-ethnic tensions in the Tajik-run mine where Nuruddin's father and grandfather had worked and enticed by the prospect of a house and land in the newly established village. By the time Nuruddin and his older sister started school, the plan that saw Aksai as a major tobacco producing farm was already retreating out of reach. In the 1990s, the collective was dismembered brick by brick, land parceled up unevenly, leaving young families with the stony, unirrigated land on which it's hard to grow anything. It's referred to locally as Kamchatka to signal its geographical and existential remoteness. Today, Aksai is the kind of place that people in the capital refer to with a mix of condescension and despair as Tupikavoya, as a place of dead ends, hemmed in on three sides by mountains and on the fourth by an increasingly tense and securitized international border. Rumors sometimes circulate of precious metals, metals hidden in the mountains, of Chinese prospectors and the lures of alpine tourism. But for all the hopes of under-earth or high mountain wealth, daily life is mostly about survival through domestic production and remittance transfers. If for the older generation, Aksai was a place with a future, for young people, it's typically spoken of as a place to leave. Nuruddin was something of a pioneer among his classmates in pinning his future on town. When I first met him in the spring of 2004, he had just returned from his second season on a Moscow construction site flush with gifts, including a new DVD player for his mother, and intent on marriage. As the eldest son of a family without a father, the pressures to find a wife, a kilin to help his mother with the chores, were significant. Bride price was about £450 in Aksai at the time, several years worth of earnings if he were to stay in the village. They had doubled in the space of just two years, and today the costs are closer to £2,000, another measure of Russia's influence. Nuridin had debts to pay. The previous year, the apricot harvest had been poor and he had borrowed money to help his younger brother get through university. Ayla Joch Baram, he said, I've no choice but to go. Both of Nuridin and Ay Jamal's daughters were born in Moscow, though raised by their paternal grandmother and uncle in the village until they were old enough to go to school. Nuridin and Ay Jamal were later joined by Nuridin's younger brother and older sister. And once the girls started school, by his mother, Saikal, Today, the three generations mostly live together in a one-room apartment in Moscow. Grandmother unable to speak Russian and granddaughters now attending school in Russia, refusing to speak Kyrgyz. Saikal still returns to the village during the toy season, the season of weddings and circumcision feasts, but she no longer stays overnight in her home and her land is no longer cultivated. Border tensions have been increasing, reaching new levels of intensity this year, and she doesn't feel safe without her sons at home. For all that their house is often locked up and empty, it is still, she insists, her son's Atajer, the land of their fathers. She doesn't want them to sell and move to Bishkek, as many others in the village have done. If we move, she says, the border will move with us. My second sketch comes from the city of Osh in southern Kyrgyzstan. Bakhtiar, an ethnic Uzbek, comes from a family of traders and craftsmen, making and selling bejeweled and devilishly sharp knives. His grandfather had built the house in which he grew up, in the majority Uzbek Mahala on the outskirts of the city. It was a house in which the walls echoed with childhood laughter and the distinctive sounds of a cutler at work. His father had added to the house, building a new quarter for guests, and he, as the youngest son, had in turn added a beautiful namaz khona, a prayer room, cool and sheltered from the searing Osh sun. In 2010, when inter-ethnic violence had coursed through Mahala streets, leaving families running to the border for safety or cowering in basements, Bakhtiar's house had been spared. But two years later, when I next met him, the violence continued to reverberate. His business had dropped off after the 2010 violence, as Uzbeks no longer frequented the central market in such numbers 
and Kyrgyz avoided his stall, preferring, as he put it, to buy imported Chinese knives instead. His wife no longer felt comfortable taking the minibus from their neighbourhood to the centre of town. By late 2012, he and his family had left for Samara, leaving his elderly parents in one corner of their large and beautiful compound, waiting for life and laughter to return. Nearly a decade on, the couple is still in Russia, the context of their departure erased in the generic description still applied to them there, astarbaiteri, guest workers. My third sketch comes from the village of Andarak at the far western end of Batken's Lelek district. Andarak is a Tajik majority village, one of the few places in Kyrgyzstan where children can receive both primary and secondary education in the Tajik language. Malika, one of the few female teachers in the school, trained in Khujand across the border to be a teacher of Tajik language and literature. And she continued her studies despite her marriage at 19 to a young man from the village with whom she had only briefly communicated by phone. Malika always had an outgoing streak. In Khujand, she taught herself Russian by hanging out with Russian speaking city girls from her dormitory. And she had started learning English by attending a club run by a visiting foreigner. She returned each weekend to Andarak swapping her city clothes for a headscarf and long skirt to clean her in-laws' home. Her in-laws were tolerant of her studies, knowing that the school needed new cadres to replace the cohort of pensioner teachers who made up most of the collective. Three years into her marriage, and after no child had been born, however, her husband's family pressured their son to divorce her and remarry. Malika returned to her parents' home before the force of gossip and painful stares from those less tolerant of her repeated city absences led her to seek an exit to Russia, where she remains to this day, cleaning dishes and floors in a high-end Georgian restaurant. In each of these three cases, we see how an account of forced migration framed as an immediate threat to life or livelihood fails to capture both the durative sense of unease that prompted a departure for Russia and the ways in which political and economic concerns overlapped mediated by a much broader set of concerns, the capacity to, to care for one's parents, to continue a family business, to walk freely in one's village without hearing slanderous or hurtful words, the possibility in short, to feel at home in one's home. In these accounts, physical and existential security are inseparable from the material conditions needed to be able to realize them. This is why houses, homes and homelands, the Atajer, figure so prominently in each case, and why the empty or lonely house, the En Sirigen Ui, is such a resonant trope for talking about this physical come existential insecurity. Migration, after all, was often described as being for the house in a double sense. New walls, roofs, paint and rooms often served as material demonstrations of sacrifice and success. They demonstrated hard graft and the capacity to overcome obstacles. They actualized one's capacity to provide for children and parents. They served as markers of taste and modernity, of social class and community and membership. In short, they demonstrated the capacity to meet a fundamental karas, a fundamental debt towards the next generation. But how has this materialized connectivity in a second sense by pointing to pasts and futures that linked families to hearths, to ancestors, to homelands, the atajer? In this context, Saikal's abandoned apricot trees, Bakhtia's empty shell of a house, or Malika's feeling of no longer being at home in her parents' house, all pointed to forms of insecurity that are at once physical and existential. So where does all, this all of this lead in thinking about the potentials for an anthropology of insecure migration? There are three points that I want to make here in conclusion. The first, quite simply, is that we need to see how migration itself can be a response to chronic insecurity, the primary means to be able to imagine a future here in place. Only in this context, I think, can we make sense of the often crippling debts that young people undertake to be able to secure an exit, debts that have been magnified in the context of the COVID pandemic as costs of departure and securing work in Russia have soared. The second is the need to situate obligation, debt and force as properly ethnographic categories, by which I mean that we need to start with an approach that takes seriously when and why for particular individuals in particular contexts, departure comes to be experienced as a compelling necessity, as majbur, from a subjective point of view. 
This in turn, I think, requires a critical examination of the ways that new forms of indebtedness, facilitated by high interest loans and neoliberalized microfinance lending, become woven into migratory projects, with debt servicing now a primary reason for departure in many parts of Central Asia. Lastly, an ethnographic approach allows us to move beyond the constricting binary of forced versus free in our discussions of migration. In each of the cases that I discussed above, departure was in a very limited sense freely chosen. It was not a straightforward response to a singular moment of crisis. None of the three uh, of my informants sought asylum in Russia. In administrative terms, each was classified as an economic migrant. Yet each emphatically described their departure as imperative. The focus on insecurity draws attention to the complex, situated and intersecting ways in which individuals and families navigate constraint and the search for social recognition in conditions that are never entirely of their own making. It shows how the political and economic are rarely easily separated, how neither exists as an abstract category, but are always experienced through particular obligations and demands in relation to other human beings, and how the temporal framing of force as a response to a singular categorical and identifiable moment of flight brackets off precisely the kind of durative pressures, repeated water shortages, ongoing border tensions, protracted domestic violence, high interest loans and so on, that are arguably some of the most salient sources of insecurity that people face in many parts of Central Asia today. Thank you very much for your attention.